to the body of Christ, amen, we need to learn to walk in our authority, amen. God does not want us to be walking around sad, walking around with our heads hung down. God wants us to know that we have authority and power with him, amen. Amen. So let's go into the word and let's uh, really just divide this thing as God would give it to us. Amen. I want to ask if everyone will turn with me to the book of 1 Kings 16, verses uh, 29 through 33. And I'm going to ask my reader if she would read those verses. And in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab, the son of Omri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 20 and 2 years. And Ahab, son of Omri, did evil before the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sense of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Esabal, king of Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. Amen. All the way down to verse 33. Verses 32 and 33. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sense of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethabel, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Amen. We have a situation here. We're talking about King Ahab. Amen. King Ahab was the king of Israel. Amen. For 22 years. Amen. But King Ahab did evil in the sight of the Lord. Amen. His wife was Jezebel. I know some of you have heard of her name. Amen. She's known uh, as a person who was evil. Amen. Somebody who played games and played tricks with the people of God. Amen. Amen. And Ahab did something uh, that was terrible in God's sight. Ahab set up altars, amen, for Baal. Amen. Baal, amen, means master possessor of or owner amen and so Baal was a false god amen Baal was someone uh, or something that they worshipped uh, uh, to give their power to amen in other words to let be owner of them amen and God does not want us to be owned by false gods amen God does not want us to be tricked and manipulated by false things amen God wants us to be free amen free to serve him, free to do his will, and free to carry out his promises. Amen? Amen. And so we have a situation where Ahab has now uh, set up uh, altars of Baal for worship. Oh my goodness. Not only did they set up the altar, but they set it up to be worshipped. They wanted the people to come in and worship this false god. Now, isn't it bad if somebody believes in something that's wrong, but then they get you to join in and be a part of that? I believe that that's a terrible sin before God. If you're doing wrong, you shouldn't encourage other people to do wrong. You should always let people know what's right and let them get for their own selves what they should be doing. Don't encourage or influence people to do things that are outside the will of God. Amen? Because God has set up a consequence for actions that are not of his will. Amen? So Ahab has now set up groves uh, after setting up the uh, altars of worship, amen, and now he sets up groves as a place to build a shrine. Now see, a shrine is a, a statue or something that's built to be looked at, admired, and worshipped. Now, I want to say this because... In these days and times, we don't really set up shrines in the physical sense, but in the mental or spiritual sense, sometimes we set up shrines. Yes, amen. We set up shrines to people who have passed away. We set up shrines to people who have, were leaders or founders of organizations. Amen. We set up shrines to things that we believe are higher than they actually are. But I want to say to you on today, we have to start tearing down whatever shrine we've set up. Amen. God does not want us setting up shrines to anything other than him. If we're in God's house and we love him, he's the only God we should be serving. There's no other person, no other thing, or no other place that we should worship more than we worship God. Yes, amen. So God here uh, 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 has allowed Ahab to, to go in an evil way. Now see, God doesn't make your mind up for you. God doesn't make you do right. He doesn't make you do evil. You have good and evil before you. 
but God would have you to do good, amen? But God allows Ahab, amen, to do what he feels is right, and Ahab does evil, amen? And by setting up Baal and the worship of Baal and the setting up of shrines, he has now provoked God to anger, amen? How many of you know that when you do things, sometimes you can provoke God to anger? Amen. So now he has provoked God so much that the Bible says that he has provoked God to anger more than all the kings of Israel before him. Now that's bad. Because now what we're finding out is that Ahab has done so much wrong. They can't just say that he uh, did a little bit. He did so much that every king before him added together. Amen. Still didn't do as much evil as Ahab did. Amen. Amen. So now we have a situation where we're going to find out, amen, uh, what Ahab is going to do in this story. Amen. Let's go now quickly to the book of 1 Kings, 21st chapter, verses 1 through 3. Amen. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And Ahab spoke unto Naboth, saying, Give me thine vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of earth, because it is near unto my house. And I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. Or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. Amen. Now we find Ahab, the Ahab, the king who did all of this evil, he met a man by the name of Naboth, amen? Naboth was a man, amen, who lived near the king's palace, amen? And so when Ahab met Naboth, he wanted his vineyard, amen? He looked out, out of the palace window and saw this vineyard, and he wanted it for himself, amen? So when he met Naboth, he said to him, I want your vineyard, amen. Give me your vineyard, amen. I want you to give it to me because I want to have it as a place uh, or have it for a garden of herbs, amen. And what, the reason he gave, because it is near to my house. Now, I want to say this to you. As people of God, amen, you have to remember everything that God has given you was given to you by God. Amen. And you can't just make quick and rash decisions, amen, with what God has given you. You have to remember that when people ask you for things, if it's something that God has placed into your hands, you have to make a good decision with what God has given you. Amen. So now he's asking Naboth for his vineyard, amen. And he said, I want to make this garden of herbs, and then I'm also willing to give you a better vineyard, amen. Or the money for the land. Now, on the surface, we may say this, this sounds kind of fair. I'm going to give you a vineyard of the same quality or a better one. Or I'm going to give you the money if you'd rather have the money. But you have to understand that Naboth was a descendant of the children of Israel. And Naboth to himself was saying, I am not going to give up this vineyard. Amen. Why did Naboth not want to give up this vineyard? Because it was given to him as a what? As an inheritance. Amen. The land that, this, that the vineyard was built on was his inheritance. Amen. And how many of you know when God gives you an inheritance, you don't want to just give it away? God intends for you to have some things for yourself. And when God has given you something as an inheritance, you want to keep what God has blessed you with. Amen. So Naboth said, no, I cannot give you this land. This land was the inheritance of my fathers. Amen. But then something happened. Amen. <laughs> After Naboth told the king that he could not give it to him. Amen. What does he say in verse 4? I'm going to ask my reader to read verse number 4. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my father. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. Now, the king was very upset Amen. that Naboth would not sell him this land. He would not trade him this land for money. And he was 
very sad and displeased. Amen. So now the king has gotten so sad and so upset and so depressed that he goes to his own room, lays on his own bed, turns his face to the wall, and would not eat. Don't you know sometimes you can go too far in your reaction in a situation? Sometimes you don't have to go as far as you go. When you are faced with an answer that is no and you were looking for a yes, you still don't have to go all the way out to left field. Sometimes when you get a no, you have to learn that your character should keep you from overreacting. We don't want to overreact in every situation. We want to learn that when the answer is yes, we know how to deal with it. When the answer is no, we know how to deal with it. Because the king is showing us by his reaction that he didn't know how to deal with no. Being the king, he was used to getting his way. He was used to people saying yes. He was used to people saying no problem, king. He was used to people just giving in to his desires or his demands. But he was sad because of Nabal's decision. Amen. But I want to say this to you. Even though he was upset, the situation was not over. Amen. We're going to find out why it was not over. Amen. Let's turn to 1 Kings 21. Let's read verses 5 through 7. But Jezebel his wife came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? And he said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite, and he said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else, if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give it thee the, thy vineyard. And Jezebel his wife said to him, Doest thou not govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. Now see, this is why I said it wasn't over. Amen. Because now you have Jezebel going to her husband and saying, why are you so sad? Amen. Why are you so displeased? Why are you not eating your bread? Amen. And Ahab begins to tell Jezebel why he is so upset. Amen. I went to Naboth and I asked him for his land. I told him I would give him money or I would give him another vineyard. Amen. Amen. And he told me he wouldn't give it to me. Amen. And Jezebel says to him, aren't you in charge? In other words, aren't you the king of Israel? Aren't you the one who makes the decisions for this country? Amen. Why are you sad? Amen. Amen. So she said, arise and eat and be merry. She said, I will give you Nabal's vineyard. Amen. Now see, on the surface you tell yourself, now how is this person going to take Nabal's vineyard from him. Amen. But Jezebel, like I said earlier, was a character that was evil in the Bible. Amen. She was someone who knew how to trick people to do the things that they wanted, she wanted them to do. Amen. Amen. So let's go down a little further in the story and let's find out how she went about to get this vineyard. Amen. Let's look at verses 8 through 13 in the same chapter. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent them to the elders and nobles who dwelt in Naboth in his city. And the letter she said, Proclaim a fast and set Naboth up high among the people. And set two men base fellows before him and let them bear witness against him, saying, You curse and renounce God, the king. Then carry him out and stone him to death. And the men of his city, the elders and nobles who dwelt there, did as Jezebel had directed in the letters sent them. They proclaimed a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. Two base fellows came in and sat opposite him, and they charged Naboth before the people, saying, Naboth cursed and renounced God and the king, and he was carried out of the city and stoned to death. Amen. I want you to see something here. Amen. Amen. Now that Jezebel has told Ahab, I'm going to give you this vineyard, she gets two men. Amen. She sent two men, amen, to get, uh, uh, to set up a situation, amen. Let's look at verse number eight. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name. Now, that's the first thing she did. She forged letters, amen, and sealed them with his seal. In other words, back in that day, the king would have a seal that when you saw the letter, you knew it came from the king, amen. So she wrote letters in his name and sealed them with the king's seal, amen. And sent the letters unto the elders and the nobles that were in his city, dwelling with Naboth. In other words, 
the place where Naboth lives, the people who rule and govern that city, send the letters to them. This is the first part of her trickery, amen. So now that she's had letters sent to the section that he lives in, now she says, okay, in the letter. And she wrote in the letter saying, proclaim a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. Now, let me help you out with this, amen. To set Naboth on high means to exalt him. Naboth, you're doing a wonderful job. You are a great person. You are doing a good job. We really like what you've done with your yard. We like your vineyard. They are setting him on high. They're putting him on a pedestal. Amen. They're lifting him up. Amen. See, sometimes when people lift you up, it is not always a good situation. Sometimes people set you up to knock you down. Amen. So this is what was going on. Naboth was being lifted up, amen, by the people. Amen. And verse 10, and set two men, sons of Belial, amen. Belial means evil, naughty, ungodly, or wicked, amen. So she went and got some men who were going to do something evil. She couldn't have chose two fair-minded men, two good men, because they wouldn't have went along with her plan, amen. So she went and got two, sent, uh, two men, sons of Belial, before him to bear witness against him, saying, Thou didst blaspheme God and the king. And then carry him out and stone him that he may die. Now, see, they set Naboth up. They was going to lift him up, exalt him, talk about how wonderful he was. And two guys were there to specifically say, you know what? You blasphemed God and the king. In other words, you spoke negatively against God. You, you said things that were ungodly about God. You disgraced and disrespected God and the king. Can you understand this situation? Can you see how sometimes when people say nice things about you, it's not always for a good reason? It's not always for a good purpose? They were setting Naboth up. Amen? Verse 11, And the men of his city, even the elders and the nobles who were inhabitants in his city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them, and as it was written in the letters which she had sent unto them. Oh, they followed her wicked direction. See, sometimes when plans are set in order, whether they're good or bad, sometimes people carry out what they've been told to do. This is why you have to understand what good direction is and bad direction is. Because if it's something that God would not have you to do, you should not follow. When it's something that God will let you know it's going to lead to a path of destruction, you should not follow. Amen. And sometimes we, we hear things and they sound good. They look good, and we say to ourselves, that must be God. But sometimes I'll say to you, the plan that God has is a hard plan. Sometimes the difficult road is the one that God has chosen. Amen. And so we have a situation here where now they're following the plan that Jezebel has set out. Amen. Verse 12, they proclaimed a fast and set Naboth on a high among the people. Amen. Could you reread verse 13 again for us, please? Two big fellows came in and sat opposite him, and they charged Naboth before the people, saying, Naboth cursed and renounced God and the king, then was carried out of the city and stoned to death. Amen. See, now that they had everything in place, and they've lifted Naboth up on high, now he's the center of attention, now the evil word comes. Amen. This is the God that spoke against God. This is the God who spoke against the king. This is the guy we have to do something about. We can no longer let him be where he is. See how high we've lifted him up? He can no longer sit in that high position. So what I suggest we do is we take him out and stone him. Amen. In other words, they wanted to kill him. Amen. So verse 13 tells us that they took him out out of the city and stoned him with stones that he died. Amen. Isn't that a terrible situation when you've done nothing wrong? And people are against you. Amen. And people are saying, you know, you know, I don't think you're doing what's right. People are questioning what you're doing. And you know that you're doing right. It's a bad situation when people are coming against you like that. Amen. Naboth did nothing wrong. He didn't go out and curse the king. He didn't curse God. He didn't cause any problems. But because the king wanted his vineyard. All of a sudden, he had to lose his life. This is what we have to understand in this world today. Sometimes situations come against us, not because we've caused them, Amen. but because of the stand we've made in our life. 
When you stand for God, there are going to be times when people just come against you. People and situations will come against you. And you'll say to yourself, why am I going through this? Why am I dealing with this person? Why am I having such a hard time with this situation? It is nothing that you have done, but it's because that you serve God and because you've given God your best and you've pledged to never take down. Amen. So things will happen in your life. Amen. Let's go a little further in the story. Let's read verses 14 through 16 in this story. Then they said to Jezebel, saying, Naboth has been stoned and is dead. Then Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to sell you. For Naboth is not alive, but dead. When Ahab heard that, he arose to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite to take possession of it. Amen. So now we have a situation where the king has now been told by Jezebel, amen, that Naboth is no longer alive. In other words, nobody's there to stop you from taking the vineyard over. So now the king has now changed his stance. He's no longer sad. He's no longer depressed or displeased. Now he's excited because he can take over the land that he wanted. Don't you know that this was an unlawful possession? He was not entitled to this land. This land was Naboth's inheritance. And if Naboth had a family, it would, should have gone to them. But the king had decided he was going to possess it. Don't you know when you take what's not yours, that's stealing? Don't you know whether it's natural or spiritual and you take something that doesn't belong to you, that's stealing? God doesn't want you stealing anything. When God gives you something, that's yours. When it's somebody else's, you're not to touch it. God would not have you to take what belongs to somebody else and make it your own. God does not like situations where we do that. Anybody remember the story of David when he looked on Bathsheba and he wanted her for himself? It was not his wife. And he made it, he sinned by sending her husband into the heat of battle. And her husband got killed in the battle, and then he took her and made her his wife. That is unlawful. Amen. And then when she had a son, the son died, and it was God who brought back to his remembrance. You took her unlawfully. Amen. David loved the son, but he died because he had made an unlawful decision, and the penalty was that his new son was going to die. So the king in this story, he has taken over Naboth's land. He went down to possess it. And we're going to find out what's going to happen to people who unlawfully possess things that don't belong to them. Amen? Let's go to 1 Kings 21, verses 17 through 23. Amen. Amen. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, in Samaria. He is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone to possess it. Say to him, Thus says the Lord, Have you killed and also taken possession? Thus says the Lord, In the place where the dogs lick the blood of Naboth shall lick your blood, even yours. And Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? And he answered, I have found you, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. See, says the Lord, I will bring evil on you and utterly sweep away and cut off from Ahab every male, bond, and free. I will make your household like that of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, like the household of Baasha, son of Ahijah, for the pro provocation with which you have provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. Also the Lord said of Jezebel, the dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Now see, these are the people who came against God. Naboth, being a child of Israel, amen, had his inheritance, and he was living on his inheritance. He was killed so that the king could have his inheritance. And when you step across the line on God, and then God says, now I have to penalize you. Sometimes God's penalty is not just a slap on the wrist. Sometimes his penalty is death for your life. So you have to remember when you start crossing God and God's people that you're facing a consequence. And when the consequence comes, you don't get to choose what the consequence is. Sometimes the consequence is more than you can bear. So you have to say to yourself, what am I going to do here? Am I going to follow God and live? Or am I going to take a chance and cross God and maybe die? 
So now God gets Elijah involved. The prophet was the man who spoke whatever God's word was. Amen. Elijah went down. To, God said, I want you to go down there and meet him. Meet him down at that vineyard where he think he's going to go and possess. Go, just go meet him down there. Amen. <laughs> I want you to go meet him and I want you to let him know something for me. Tell him I said that the dogs will lick your blood in the same place that the dogs lick Naboth's blood. That's a hard judgment. God is letting him know. Remember, remember the guy that you had killed and the dogs licked his blood by the vineyard? You're going to die right there too. They're going to lick your blood in the same place. Now, he not only tells Ahab that his blood was going to be licked, but then he said, oh, and by the way, let me help you out with your wife who connived and schemed this plan. Let me tell you what's going to happen to her as well. Amen. She is now going to be eaten by the dogs by the wall of Jezreel. You know what the significance of that is? The wall of Jezreel is the, is the wall that separated the Jezreelites from the other people. Naboth was a Jezreelite. In other words, I'm going to let all the people see your wife be eaten by the dogs. I'm trying to tell you today that God is not playing about himself or his business. Anytime you cross God, you are asking for trouble. I don't want to be on the other side of God when trouble hits. Because when trouble hits, what is God going to do with you? Is God going to spare you or is he going to make an example out of you? I say to you today, based on what we've read so far, God will make an example out of you. He will put you out there and let people see you that when you cross him, this is what may happen to you. So never find yourself crossing God or his people. Amen. Amen. If there's somebody in the house of God you don't get along with, don't cross them. If it's somebody, if you don't like your pastor, don't cross him. If you don't like your church, don't cross him. You make sure you do what you should be doing. If you need to leave, leave respectfully. If you need to be around people, be respectful around them. Don't cause problems for God's people because when God gets in the middle of it, there's no decision that you can make. God didn't ask anybody about this decision. He didn't consult with anyone and say, I think I'm going to do this. No, he said, this is what's going to happen. Amen. And how many of you know when God makes up his mind, he only him can change the plan. He can only change the plan. That's right. Amen. None of us can go to God and change his mind. If he has said in his own mind he's going to do it, it's going to happen. Amen. And only if he decides to change his mind would the plan then be changed. Verse 20, I like how Ahab says to Elijah, Has thou found me? <laughs> we didn't know you were lost. <laughs> how did you know somebody was looking for you? See, when you do wrong, you start expecting that people are going to show up. You start expecting that people are going to question you and people are going to be watching over your shoulder. That's why you shouldn't do wrong because when you do wrong for so long, your whole life, now you're just looking over your shoulder. You're looking to see who's following you. You're looking to hear what that noise is. You want to know who that is talking. Who is that driving down the street? Because you've done so much wrong that now your conscience is guilty. Amen. Amen. King Ahab was guilty. When he saw the prophet coming, he hadn't even told him what the prophecy was. He said, have you come to find me? Are you looking for me? What did I do? Parents, you know the feeling sometimes when your children do stuff at the house, they do things around the house, and they'll say, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. Amen. You haven't even asked a question, and they're already telling you that they didn't do it. Amen. In other words, you must know or have knowledge of something that must have happened, and you may have had a part in it. So verse 20, Ahab says to Elijah, hast thou found me, O my enemy? Now the prophet's his enemy. Amen. When you do wrong, the people of God are always going to be your enemy because they're always going to speak against what you're doing. They're always going to tell you what you're doing is wrong. You need to change your ways. You need to turn around. You need to become a different person. So now he says to him, hast thou found me, O my enemy? Later on in the verse he says, thou hast 
said, thou hast sold thyself. This is what Elijah is saying to him. Thou hast sold thyself <laughs> to work evil in the sight of the Lord. <laughs> in other words, you can be bought with a price. <laughs> you listen to your wife. You let her tell you how to get this land. You knew that you got this land and it was illegal for you to get this land. You knew it. But you sold yourself. You sold yourself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. How many of you know that some people have a price? Some people have a price and they will sell themselves to do evil. They will sell themselves to do things that are not right. They will sell themselves to say and do things that God will not approve of. And if you are a child of God, your price should be so high that nobody can buy you. Your price should be so high that nobody can approach your price. Your price should be so high that nobody would even walk up to you and ask you. Because you are saying, I can't be bought. We've already been purchased one time. Jesus went to the cross and purchased us with his blood. How could we be purchased again if Jesus has already purchased us? Thank you, Jesus. Don't you know in every state in this country that if you sell something to somebody and then turn around and sell it again, that is an illegal sale? It's the same applies in the spirit. If Jesus has purchased you, you now belong to him. And no amount of money, no amount of whatever property, whatever, should purchase you again. The thought just came to my mind, stop selling yourself short. Somebody wants to buy you. Somebody wants to influence you. Somebody wants to tell you something that's not truthful. Tell them my price is too high. Jesus purchased me with his blood. Do, are you, do you have something more valuable than that? I don't believe that you do. That's the most valuable thing there is. So since you can't purchase me, don't question me. Don't ask me things. Don't tell me to do things that are evil. Don't tell me to do things that are wrong. So now we know that King Ahab has sold himself. Amen. And, and the prophet has a prophesied to him, you're going to die and your wife going to die too. Amen. And this is how you're going to die. Amen. Let's, let's, let's skip down a little bit. I want to get a little more of this in. Amen. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 22. We're going to just read verse number 38. I want to skip ahead in the story so we can understand God's prophecy. And they washed his chariot by the pool of Samaria, where he har where harlots baked, and dogs licked up his blood, as the Lord predicted. Amen. King Ahab, in chapter 22 of 1 Kings, he was killed in battle. Now, he was killed in battle, but then they returned him, or he was returned to his own country. So, in other words, when you died in battle, they took you back to the country that you were from. <laughs> And when they took him back to his own country, they washed his chariot out in the pool of Samaria, which is the same place where Naboth was laid. Amen. And the dogs came up and licked his blood. I want to say to you on today, God's prophecy is sure. God's word is sure. You can't change it. You can't alter it. You can't make it of none effect. So we have Ahab now being killed. Amen? Amen? Now we have one order of business left. Amen. Ahab has been killed. Now God's attention is turned to Jezebel. Amen. Amen. Jezebel was the one who put the plan together. Amen. She was the one who convinced her husband, this is what we can do. We can get this land. Don't worry about it. Stop crying. Go ahead and eat your bread. We're going to take care of this. <laughs> God says, but for Ahab, I, I've already taken care of that. He said, but for Jezebel, I'm going to send in a special agent. Yes, thank you, Jesus. Amen. God decided to pick a man by the name of Jehu. Yes, amen. amen. This is the part that I like. Yes. Jehu was handpicked by God. Amen. I wanted, to, I wanted you to get to the, to the part of the story where we are so that I don't get too excited. I can tell you all about Jehu. Amen. I'm going to ask you to turn with me to the book of 2 Kings, the ninth chapter, and we're going to start with verses 1 through 7. Amen. 2 Kings 9, 1 through 7. Amen. And Elisha the prophet called one of his sons of the prophets and said to him, Gird up your loins, take this flask of oil in your hand, and go to Ramoth Gilead. 
Will you arise, look there for Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, son of Nimshi, and go in and have him arise from among his brethren and lead him to an inner chamber. Then take this cruise of oil and pour it on his head and say, Thus says the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. Then open the door and flee, do not tarry. So the young man, the young prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead, and when he came in, the captains of the army were sitting outside, and he said, I have a message for you, O captain. Jehu said, To which of us? And he said, To you, O captain. And Jehu arose, and they went into the house. And the prophet poured the oil on Jehu's head and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I have anointed you king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel. You shall strike down the house of Ahab your master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and all of the servants of the Lord who have died at the hands of Jezebel. Uh -huh. See, Jehu was not just called. Yes, he was chosen. 